Welcome back. Continuing our coverage here of the Hall of Chains. Uh, this is the third video. It looks like it's going to be four in total. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the third encounter. And uh, it's kind of a really cool thing they do here. That's They draw back to the original game where, of course, the Underworld was one of the first bits of Endgame they ever really added. Uh, really phenomenal stuff. So just to remember, there'll be a link in the description if you guys haven't caught the other two videos in this little series here on the latest wing. But we've just escorted Desmina up the river of souls and in the middle of that encounter quite uh, casually actually just dropped in that the final boss and the main guy that we're scared of right now is doom so everything's kind of laid on the line and when we get to the end of the spirit run we have this extremely curt conversation I mean I said at the start of this that the law was light on the ground and in terms of raw dialogue it's really true uh, have a listen to this this is what we need to do for encounter three it's safe here I'll wait for you you have work to do. What work? If we can take back the three Grenth statues from Doom, we can break the seal on the hall. And what will you be doing while we handle the statues? I need to recover if I'm going to fight Doom. If our allies arrive, I'll be here to greet them. Now go. And that's it. So very short, very precise. This is what you need to do. Go do it and we're off really. There's a very sly suggestion that there are going to be some allies and they'll take some effect in a short while. And yeah, that's it really. By the way, the awesome noise you can hear in the background there, yeah, that's Doom speaking. Whenever somebody slash GGs or dies, he like echoes his voice throughout the entire wing saying stuff like, all must end. It's fantastic. They established that we're in a bit of a safe space, but what a safe space it is. So just before we get to the encounter itself and talk about this, uh, you know, this gameplay that's coming up, let's see what she means with the seal on the wall. Where do we find ourselves? Well, before the Hall of Judgment. Uh, but it's closed, and that's the seal that we need to break our way through. So at this point, as a player, uh, especially after the Griffin unlocked, a huge amount of the Underworld is now available for exploration. Not all of it has anything interesting to do there, but you can really wander around a lot. Uh, the Hall of Judgment really is the main thing that you're probably going to be keen about. Uh, this is returning from Guild Wars 1. That's a fact I wasn't necessarily too confident about originally, but the point of interest, I mean, literally says it's the Hall of Judgment. This is where new souls would go to be judged by Grenth. He would sit in there, he would judge you, send you on your way. So I guess it's actually quite fitting that this River of Souls is now going directly to it. But Grenth is not in the underworld anymore. Someone else is in there. It's Doom. So really beautiful looking tower. It reminds me a lot of the Ebony Citadel of Malix, which was another massive tower based thing that you found in an end game area, but that was the Domain of Anguish. Uh, and there was a giant Marganite monkey that lived there. I was surely hoping that, because obviously the final boss is going to be in that building, I was hoping that the uh, raid would take us up the tower because we got to go into the bottom of the tower in the original game and that was lots of fun. But being able to climb, similar to how Deimos in Wing 4 took us up or down to another realm in the middle of the fight. Perhaps this one we were going to slowly climb the tower as we did battle. That never ended up happening, but just being able to return there in the second game has been great. Where the scale really has been amped up because now we've got all this extra height and things we can move around with the new mounts. So, uh, so yeah, interesting area and we'll get into that building later. But for now, we have to take a slight diversion into some separate areas for Encounter 3. So this part of the race is awesome and it's a very blunt obvious reference back to the underworld of Guild Wars 1. I'll spare you an enormous story but basically the underworld in that game was yes a bit like a raid in that it was end game and it was difficult to do and it was one of your last things you'd be aiming for but uh, it was also a massive non-linear map to explore like Queensdale or any of the open world places we see in Guild Wars 2 and the New Living World map say. It was more like that than a Guild Wars 2 raid which is kind of more of a narrow single path more dungeony in its uh, setup so the story back then was that there are all these different monuments to Grenth and you'd wander around the underworld going to each of them and then finding reapers at them and you sort of participating in various tasks and what does Desmina ask us to do here go to these statues of Grenth and uh, deal with the things that are happening in that area. And it's not just because it's a story reference to the way that it used to work, but mechanically it's similar as well. 
just as the original game players could to a great extent choose what order they wanted to do things in, you here in Guild Wars 2 can as well. Which of the three parts of Encounter 3 you go to, first, second or third, that's on you. And uh, they even go a little bit deeper than this as well. See, the original Guild Wars players kind of exploited the fact that you could do anything in any order and would split up in speed clears eventually. And people got so good at this that it got to the point where you have like eight players all of them in different directions all soloing various quests all at once so that instead of having one crew that rolled the entire way around the underworld and finished in like an hour or two you could have the entire thing cleared in you know less than half an hour or whatever the eventual speed clear records ended up being which was actually quite ludicrous by the end so this idea of splitting the team up to do all three at once the devs really do seem to, through the mechanics on this, encourage. There's even an achievement uh, in Guild Wars 2 to beat the three within five minutes of one another. So the timer starts after the first one ends and then you've got to get the others done. And I just don't think that's possible unless you split up. I don't know, I've not played, as I said, too much of this wing, but I'm pretty sure that you'd have to split up for that instead of zerging around. That achievement isn't the only way they seem to have encouraged a bit of splitting up. I'll show you some other ones as we go through. But let's take the uh, encounters one by one and I'll talk about the order my group usually clears these in, which would start with the Broken King at the Statue of Ice. We got the Statue of Ice, Darkness, and Death to do. We'll start with Ice. Doom get free. With every death, he grows stronger. Doom devoured souls for centuries to regain the power to break his bonds. He then manipulated the river and corrupted much of the underworld. He's seizing territory to mount his escape to the mortal realm. What happened to you? I severed the union of my spirit and body to defy Doom's influence. I persevered. Which statue should we head for first? The order is unimportant. Get control of them and get back to me as soon as you can. Who are the allies you mentioned? Ancients. And? Okay. Good talk. What happens if Doom escapes? Plague, pestilence, the irrevocable consumption of mortal souls, the annihilation of humanity. So this is an ice elemental boss, very, very, very simple encounter. There's very little I need to talk to you guys about here. So it's a toughness tank. This is the first bit of toughness tanking we've seen here because obviously encounter two was an escort. Encounter one had the runes. Uh, so he does massive like cone damage. You have your tank, make sure he's facing the boss away from everyone else. And uh, the, the trick with this boss is as you kill him, there are these icy meteors that start crashing to the ground and you need to collect them. If they land on the ground and nobody's standing there to catch them as they fall, they pass out like insane damage. So it's a little bit more complicated than that in that if there's an icy meteor standing where the boss is aiming, that can be a bit of a dangerous place to try and get them, though your tank can usually cover that just fine. Uh, if you eat a meteor, you get like a debuff and it says, oh, be careful, you shouldn't do this too much and you have to wait a while for the debuff to turn off. But if you eat two in a row, it will stack to two, it will stack to three. If you take four meteors too quickly, I think it just like instant kills you. So the whole team needs responsibility of collecting these. It's not just like one guy can take the mechanic by running around collecting the meteors. Everyone needs to spread out because you get this debuff on you. And I think that this wing actually does that very well, sharing responsibility amongst the whole group in a lot of cool ways. Some of the other uh, raid encounters in Guild Wars 2 haven't quite accomplished that so well. So that's the main thing. And uh, you, you'll notice a balance here, right? The important thing is that these meteors spawn as the boss is damaged. So the faster you kill him, the quicker the meteors come down, and the more difficult it is to, uh, you know, not go over on your debuffs, right? Because you're being asked to catch too many meteors too quick. So if anything, the encounter actually asks you to slow down damage. There's kind of like a perfect range of damage for you to hit. The less players you have, because there's no enrage timer on this or any of these, by the way, the less players you have, kind of the easier this becomes because the meteors come slower and you're at more liberty to just sort of relax about when you get them. So you can see here this idea of splitting. This is an encounter that, if anything, is better with a few less people to eight man this to seven man this or less is actually it gets increasingly more comfortable if you're all really good at the game you're going to trigger too many meteors too quickly and you're going to have to like start holding damage so i think that's a really interesting way of looking at that to see how you can have less players there while the rest of your uh, squad is off in a different area of the 
underworld doing something else. So um, there's also the introduction of kind of a, a new animation here. There's these icy cracks that appear on the ground. You want to stay away from, do massive damage. That's going to reappear in the final encounter. So much of this stuff is just about reappearing in the final encounter. So uh, yeah, that's the fight. Really simple. I don't want to hang on about that too much. During the fight, this uh, elemental does speak. He says a few interesting things. He says, Doom awakens, dot, 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 fueled by dark powers, that Doom remains eager to reclaim his seat. The ender of all is all powerful, and Doom's reign brutal, uncompromising. So what I'm really interested in here is this first line, that Doom awakens, fueled by dark powers. So why is Doom awakened again, you might be wondering. Well, this was established, well, this story we're experiencing here really was the Guild Wars 1 story as well, that he's, you know, wrestling free and we need to put him back down. Back then, if I remember correctly, the idea was it was the consumption of newly dead that helped him to break free. Um, here they just call it Dark Powers. I wonder if this is the first wing in a series located in different areas of the underworld, whether they're going to explore a little bit more of that, fueled by dark powers. They leave that just there, hanging, and I think a lot of players wouldn't even really think about asking a question what that means, because it just seems like, you know, nonsense, random filler dialogue almost. But I do wonder about that a little bit. Also, it says he's eager to reclaim his seat. Well, we'll see in a moment that he actually has managed to reclaim it, and his uh, reign brutal, uncompromising. What is really awesome about this lore-wise, though, guys, is this broken king, this ice elemental, is a very clear reference to something, again, we saw in the original Underworld. And that's not something they've done yet. You'll remember, like, that village at the start of this wing, the uh, Spirit River. None of these are, like, really great references back to original Underworld stuff, except, I guess, the Gwen ghost Easter egg. Here, we're actually looking at King Frozenwind, obviously. So this is a prominent Guild Wars 1 NPC. Actually made in reference to a prominent communion member, if I remember correctly. Um, but this was an NPC in the Underworld who uh, specifically helped us defend the Hall of Judgment and keep it safe back in the original game. And now when we get here 250 years later, well, the poor guy has fallen to Doom's influence and is not defending the Hall at all. It's obviously been given up to Doom here. So I think that's brilliant to have seen him here. If you're wondering why is it just an ice elemental, well, don't forget that uh, ice was like Grenth's domain. So the idea that he'd have icy, icy associated stuff in his realm makes perfect sense. This actually makes me think Balthazar should probably have had like a really cool prominent fire elemental buddy. Could still do that, I suppose, but that would have been nice to see him part of fire. But there you go. So uh, that is uh, King Frozen Wind. I thought that was all really brilliant. Even on top of that as well, in the area, there's another journal on the ground. This is the other main one you find here. Uh, so I'll just read you the dialogue. It says here, you discover a journal in a pocket on the robed corpse. Uh, and it says this, that we've lingered here for what seems weeks. There is no escape. Our empty stomachs ache. Below, a frozen abomination conjures storms and mutters ravings about his master, the false god of death, Doom. We have no choices left to us. There is no exit in sight. We've seen no sign of the legendary Reapers. Uh, so referring obviously to the Reapers, which yes, probably as players you're questioning why we haven't seen them. Uh, next it goes on and it says, We've seen none of our brothers or sisters who might also have answered the call of the red-robed woman we believe to be our Lord's most ardent follower, Desmina. And of course, we as players know that that's true now. We he hear a woman's voice and the impacts of a siege booming in the distance. Perhaps this ice creature has captured her or harmed her in some way. Or perhaps these happenings are unrelated. We've no way to confirm. We're mired in a literal fog of war. While we have no way of knowing whether our actions will help Grenth or Desmina's cause, we have decided to act against this ice-crowned brute before our strength wanes. Any ally of the Master of Nothingness is anathema to the brothers and sisters devoted to the Defeater of Doom. May Grenth shield us. And this is Priestess Nyla, the Dark One's humble servant in life and death. So, nothing super profound, I guess, there, but I really do like the flavor and what we get from that. This specific Priestess Nyla, I don't think is a, is a reference character. My first thought when I first saw this was it could have been the uh, Priestess you meet in the personal story who does a ritual with you as a human character and then reappears again at the end when there's a particular instance where we meet one of Grenth's Reapers. Um, but I don't think it's the same character. And, uh, well, they're dead here now. Maybe we'll get a little bit more story later. I'm unsure. But, uh, yeah, we hear a little bit more about these people lured here by Desmina and just sort of died. Seems Desmina, if you really think about it, wasn't doing any of these guys a favor. Luring them in, they're dying, and for what exactly? 
It wasn't exactly very helpful to our cause, was it? But we, of course, the badasses that we are, go in and we successfully defeat the Broken King. And that's one part of the encounter done. Okay, so let's talk about another one of the statues now. Uh, this is probably the most complicated statue of them all, and hopefully I do a good job describing it to you guys. Uh, let's talk about the Statue of Death. And already, lore-wise, this is very interesting. Fascinating, even. Obviously, we've got the Soul River nearby, and we've had Desmina talking about eating souls, and we're in the underworld. So naturally, we find a creature that is eating souls here. But this boss at this statue is not uh, like a totally new model or rig or whatever. It's not a torture web, as we talked about in the previous video. Instead, we have a mouth of Zaitan playing the part. A mouth of Zaitan. This isn't the first mouth of Zaitan we've seen either in the Underworlds. Uh, if you guys have played the Path of Fire story, you'll remember there was an Eater of Souls just like this one in the raid, but there was one in the personal story too during our very brief, brief visit to the Mists uh, when we were in the Domain of the Lost. So, yes, it's a mouth of Zaitan in the Underworld, an agent of the Elder Dragon of Death in the Realm of Death. So, in the personal story 2012, the mouths of Zaitan were like some of the super dangerous, deadly, ultimate minions of Zaitan, okay? And what they did is they ate magical artifacts, which sort of fed Zaitan power. There was a whole thing about it during the Orient arc. And I'm wondering now, because we see one in the Underworld eating souls, I wonder if the ones on Tyria in 2012 could also uh, eat souls. Is that what they were kind of doing as they were consuming this magical uh, energy as well? I guess it's a bit of a rabbit hole here that we're definitely circling around. Are the developers suggesting something by having an Elder Dragon minion model here? Is it mere coincidence that these two themes of death have been paired up in this way? The simple act of seeing this is pretty huge, but I guess that's a rabbit hole we'll just tease here instead of plunging down, but I'd love to hear what you guys think in the comments. So, uh, this is a simple encounter to beat, but it's very layered, and there are various things to do in it. It's almost like it feels like it's trying to tell a story as you progress in the fight. I feel like this encounter probably would have been better as a fully-fledged boss, rather than just deliberately tuned to be kind of easier because it's one third of, a, of an encounter and all three of these are tuned to be easier again because I think they want the, de the players to feel comfortable splitting as they do them. You could beat this guy while also some other people are taking on King Frozen would say. So um, once again we get a lot of mechanics again that are introduced and relevant for the final boss and uh, especially when you compare this to the spirit run both have got a lot to do with the nature of what it means to die in the underworld in that you don't really go straight to defeated you can become orbs and things so uh, let's talk about it first it's a toughness tank again second and really importantly this boss is invulnerable I mean he's already in the underworlds so what happens when you kill him well he just comes back he just resets his health. You put him to zero health, he just goes back to 100. He's invincible. He cannot be killed. And so that should leave you scratching your head. How do you actually get through this? Well, all will be revealed. And uh, thirdly as well, every now and then during this fight, an innocent soul just traveling through the underworld, maybe from the river, I don't know, just appears. A lost soul will appear in the area. And the mouth will try to eat it. If the mouth successfully eats any of these lost spirits, everybody wipes is instantly over. Okay. So let's just first talk about saving this spirit. It's actually really quite simple. Once the spirit appears and the mouth targets them, you get a big green circle uh, on the ground telling you this is happening. And some of your players in your squad can go and stand next to the spirit. Uh, and if you stand next to it instead, when the mouth tries to instantly reap this spirit, it will instead kill you. So you'll sacrifice yourself instead of the lost soul. And what that means is again, just like in the spirit run encounter, instead of you being instantly defeated, you instead get split away from your body and you become a soul. So as a soul this time, on the previous encounter, you would just run around collecting orbs and come back to life. This time you don't quite have that luxury. You're thrown into the air and you get special new abilities and you just kind of float around going up and down and sort of observing the fight from above. You meander around up there for a while until eventually the game warns you your spirit is weakening because you haven't got back to your body or whatever yet. Your spirit's weakening and then you get defeated. Finally, then you die. You can kind of get around that by flying out of bounds, by the way, and then you instead go downstate and people can res you. But I don't think the devs intended that. 
So, uh, also at this point, while you're floating around in the sky, the boss can get a break bar and he'll try and eat you. Instead, he'll suck you in like a vacuum and you'll be getting sucked towards the middle of him. So this idea of being a spirit flying around in the air and getting sucked into the boss and all this stuff is all reappears in the final fight. But uh, for the purposes of this fight, that's kind of what it is. You stand next to the soul, you save the soul's life, but now you're in the air and eventually you'll die up there. So some of you guys are going to be like, okay, I don't get it. Well, what's the point of this? You can save the soul just to sacrifice yourself a little bit later. And eventually all your raid members will be defeated and it's over. Well, yes, technically that's what would happen. But there's something else going on. So let's talk about the other thing. Again, the boss is invulnerable. But every now and then while fighting the boss, a twisted spirit will spawn. That's not the lost souls. It's a twisted spirit. It's, it's a spider. A ghostly spider will spawn. And this thing's actually trying to kill you, okay? So if you kill the spider, it's not too hard. When the spider dies, it explodes into five orbs of light, which scatter across the middle of the room. And so you'll see orbs re reappearing here. Orbs have appeared in so many different areas of this wing. Uh, there you go. So uh, what your players can do now is walk over to these orbs. And when you walk over to them, you'll pick it up and get access to a special action key that allows you to throw it. A bit like at Sabathur where you can throw sapper bombs, right? So um, you can throw these orbs anywhere you like, but nothing will happen really in most places that th you throw them. But you might notice something. If you look very carefully at the environment, there are several like large rectangular, almost domino looking areas and if you throw those orbs that came from the spider onto the, the rectangles they will light them up they'll like light up the platform so if your entire team grabs all of these you can fully like charge one of these rectangles that's on the floor like you're uh, prepping a, a ritual of sorts so if you throw all of them onto a single of these dominoes, light it fully up then drag the boss onto it and kill him on it, you still won't kill him but something special will happen. The boss won't die, he'll regenerate, but he'll like, it will cause him to spit up a ton of the souls and things that he must have eaten, I guess, before we got there or whatever. And these now go floating up into the sky. So, remember that other mechanic where we've saved a thing and now some of our players are in the sky as well? Well, if you time all of this stuff together, which isn't too hard, it's obviously designed to be timed together. If you time all of it correctly, your players who have been split away from their bodies and are floating around in the sky can now float around and collect the orbs that are also in the sky, just like in the spirit run instance, where you died, you got separated from your body and you had to collect spirits to come back to life. So you can now do this and that will save your life and allow you to come back down all perfectly fine. I think you need to collect five. So uh, there is another final side effect of this. If you manage to complete all these mechanics there, you might notice on the far side of the uh, encounter area, there are some torches on a wall and these light up. Once you do this several times, you can light up all of the torches. And once all of the torches are lit and you defeat the mouth one final time, he will die for good. Ugh. So if that sounded convoluted and kind of weird, uh, I apologize. That's the best way I can probably describe it in order. Like I said, it's actually quite a simple encounter to execute, but it's quite layered in all the different things that are going on and why you're doing what you're doing. I don't think this encounter actually does well enough to fully justify why all of its mechanics are a thing and like what the story is there. And I feel like this lighting up the light might be a reference to something that I just sort of don't get. Um, but once that's all done and you kind of complete this ritual, you can actually defeat the mouth for once and for all. And that is the second statue cleansed. You can use the uh, sand jackal to teleport back up to the central area. So there you go. The final encounter. Let's talk about this now. This is the Statue of Darkness. This one I love. Again, I talked a bit about the Ebony Citadel of Malix earlier from the Domain of Anguish. Well, one of the things I love from Doa in the original game was Ravenheart Gloom. A pure black abyssal plane of darkness that you traveled around lighting it up with a shard, a light of Dwayna, or at least when you were a noob you did, and then later you just sort of learn it off by heart, even playing in the dark. Uh, and so they kind of seem to do something similar here. We go underneath the hall into a dark cave scattered with labyrinthine ruins that you sort of have tricky to, uh, navigation through. And this is where the final encounter takes place. Our objective is to defeat two bosses at once. The bosses, again, are another Zaitan reference. They are Eyes of Zaitan this time. You've got the Eye of Judgment and the Eye of Fate. So, uh, fitting ideas for Grenther as well. 
I'll note what some of you guys are thinking, that maybe this doesn't mean anything in law, that they're just reusing these models and we're not supposed to think any deeper. But really, I mean, the writers would have considered that, right? Don't you think they'd be at least cagey about just so happening to reuse Zaitan stuff here? I do think it's uh, deliberate. Otherwise, they would have avoided Zaitan-related models like the plague, surely. Also, it's really kind of fun just being able to fight these models again, because for a lot of us, we don't hang around in awe much anymore. We don't do the personal story anymore. It's been years and years since we've experienced a legitimate fight with these kinds of creatures, especially with the power creep in the game at this point. So uh, it, it has been fun to look back at them. So uh, yes, the point of this encounter is quite simple. We have to kill both eyes at once. Uh, this is a, a format and a formula that we've seen in Guild Wars many, many, many times. But the idea is the eyes will keep teleporting to random locations around the labyrinth, and the labyrinth is split in two. So half your team's going to go into like the north half of the labyrinth, half's going to go into the south half, half of the labyrinth, and um, they're going to be like two separate strike teams fighting the eye at once. And let me just pause for a second, remember, that already is just one third of the full thing, so if you're trying to split to do all the encounters at once, uh, I cannot imagine the logistical nightmare that that would be and the interesting ways you could split your team, because the eye encounter, the darkness statue, requires you split at least two ways, the other encounter requires you to split in various ways to make sure you know who's going into the sky and who's not, frozen wind, you can have very few people, but you need at least some, I don't know, I think that would be some really amazing sort of build craft to figure out the perfect strap for all of this, but uh, yeah, so you're going to split half and half, and the only time you can actually kill the eyes and do any damage to them is when they are illuminated by light and the light comes from these light orbs that only spawns on a ledge above the labyrinthine areas in the center of the room. So what you're going to do is have half your team fighting one eye, half your team fighting another eye, and another player, and that's the footage you're looking at here, in the middle, dedicated to throwing the light to the team so that they've got what they need. Uh, some other things complicate this. There are some ghosts uh, that will try to steal the light from themselves and get extremely angry with you when you take it from under their nose and they could just instantly kill you. So you need kind of a, a build that's capable of being fast enough to get away from them, sustain from them. And there are some minotaurs that can spawn in the labyrinth as well, uh, which are super deadly and super dangerous. And uh, I've never actually played in the teams down below, but I think you can explode the light orbs to stun the minotaurs and get away from them or counter damage them. Um, and so there is a few different ways you can uh, take this. I like using squad markers so you can always see where the eyes are moving to and throw the light to appropriately. And uh, yeah, both teams gonna just try and burn their eyes down at about the right time. And with them both defeated, that is the final statue complete. And the seal to the Hall of Judgment open. I'll also point out with the Labyrinth thing and the Minotaurs, this could be more Guild Wars 1 referencing because like the Ache from the first game that were in there and that you basically start in a Labyrinth style area, so maybe the devs were going for something on that, it wouldn't surprise me. The influence of the statues overcome Doom's corruption. The gates are unlocked, our allies are here. We will do what must be done, Red Witch. We return to silence the voice in the void. Defend us to the death! If one of us falls before the ritual begins, Doom's escape is assured! Do not let them fail the ritual. I'll help as my strength allows. And there we have it, guys. That is Encounter 3. Join me next time for the grand showdown with the final boss, Doom, which is going to incorporate a huge amount of the different things you have heard from these previous three videos. And also, I'll give you some uh, badass extra lore and uh, trivia and interesting things about Doom. And also, we get to talk about where the story's going from this, where the next wing will be. Will it be in the underworld again? Uh, what will Desmina's role be? And there's a bit of a big twist as, obviously, we get to the end here. So, I'll have that out very soon for you guys. I'm actually making this video and the next one back to back. So, so uh, it shouldn't be a wait at all for you all. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to move forward. So thanks, guys. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, any clarifications about mechanics and tips for people, obviously, please feel free to leave down below because I'm by no means an expert on Wing Fire. I've not played it anywhere near as much as the other stuff. Uh, so yeah, let me know, guys. Thanks, and I will see you very shortly.